I grew up going to parks, being outside. I take my kids there. I want my grandkids to go there. I want you know their grandkids to go there. So I, I'm fortunate to to do something that I think that I think matters. My name is Grant Hildebrand. I'm a regional wildlife biologist for the National Park Service, and I'm, I'm part of the team that's conducting the uh, the bear portion of the the research on the Katmai Coast. The reason. Katmai was, was chosen for this, for this study is this tight linkage that we see between clams and salmon and bears where it, it ties together the marine and the terrestrial ecosystem. We are putting out collars. We're handling the bears three times a year. A fairly small number of bears considering how many bears are on the coast, but we're looking at about 10 bears a year. We handle the bears in the spring, the summer, and the fall. Deploy the collar in the spring, and we'll pull the collar in the fall. So they'll just be in the in the study for one year. There'll be a different set of bears each year for a total of a, a three-year study. So one thing we want to take a look at. See, we have a nice fit. See how much room there was for her. Yeah. The sun in the spring, and we just don't want to get in too tight. You can see no rubbing. She's in good shape. Each time we handle the bear, we weigh it, we determine its body fat content. And we collect a variety of different biological samples, uh, yep. blood, hair mostly, and a little sliver of claw. And by doing that, we can trace what the animals have been eating through time. Basically, we're just following different isotopes and sort of, you know, you are what you eat. If you think about both the hair and the claw, they're inert tissues. It's kind of like a fingernail. Once it's laid down, it's fixed. There's no blood flowing through it. it it's not changing. And so if you take, say, a length of a claw or a length of hair, the part that's furthest away from the bear, in essence, is the oldest. And as you move closer to the animal, you're getting a more near-term dietary signature. So you can kind of look at that through time. Blood's a little bit different in that it's an active tissue. It's constantly turning over. And so with the blood, we'll do both serum and red blood cells. And serum turns over every um, 15, 20, 30 days, whereas the red blood cell fraction turns over more like about every 120 days. And so even out of that one sample, we're getting two different dietary windows, a more recent dietary history and then a longer term dietary history. When we do the analysis, we can figure out how important is that time period and within that time period, what are the most important resources, which ones are they actually utilizing. And so in the end, we'll have an idea in the spring what they weigh what their body composition is, basically how fat they are, how much muscle mass they have. That same information in the summer and then again in the fall. So we get an idea of what they're doing kind of from an energetic standpoint through the year. But also with those changes, we can figure out what foods are most important during those time periods. So in addition to um, that physiological data, each of these collars has a GPS unit. So we're getting locations basically every hour of the bears. So we have an idea of where they're spending time, where they're going, what they're doing. The other kind of unique thing with these GPS collars as well is they're active 24 hours a day. So we'll also get an idea if we're seeing somewhat different behaviors within a given bear, daylight versus darkness. Granted, we don't get a lot of, of, of darkness here, but also there's certainly just more human activity here in the day than there is at night. And so we may get some idea if there's some difference there also. The collar itself, its size relative to the, the size of the bear is pretty insignificant. Probably the, the one thing we'll, we will see on some bears, not even all, is you will get some kind of hair loss, just a little bit rubbed out, that kind of thing. But it's, it's a really minor effect to them. And one thing that's a little bit unique here uh, is there's so much air traffic. There's, there's a bit less of a pursuit because they're just, they're just so used to the sound of aircraft. They don't really even start running. Even the bears that we're catching for a second time, they're not really running until we're right on them with the helicopter, which, I mean, from a stress standpoint, is, is great because the less they run, the better. So without without question, there's a level of stress to, to the capture. There's a level of risk to the capture. We just look for, for ways to, to minimize that any way we can. Probably the most important decision we make through the whole process is just do we or do we not dart a bear, just given the ter terrain and topography and the things that can happen. So we, we turn down far, far more bears than we actually go ahead and choose to go ahead and try and catch. I've probably I probably handled between eight and nine hundred bears at this point, and and occasionally we lose bears. Um, it's it's far less than one percent, um, but we do lose bears, and so there's always a risk, and it's something we um, you know, we we do not take we do not take lightly. We want to be responsible in the sense that we need to collect enough information that we have confidence in what we're finding, but we also want to be responsible and not handle any more bears or handle bears any more times than we really have to to get at the at the questions we're trying to address. I guess if you think long enough, people refer to you as having a certain level of expertise, but being an expert just means you know how much you don't know. I've been doing it more than 20 years. I've never had a day in the field where I don't see something that absolutely amazes me. Part of what's, I think, fascinating about the study 
or that we're all really intrigued about is we just don't really know where all these bears go, what they do, um, how they spend their year. Having a better understanding of the system, the connectivity, how important these resources are to bears, what the bears are doing. And that's a story we can share with, you know, not only visitors, but also, you know, the folks that may never have a chance to come visit this park. What gets us stoked is, you know, we're kind of reading it with everybody else. We got no idea how it's going to end.